Um, it's my pleasure to introduce again Andy Pitts, who will tell us about constructing initial algebras using inflationary iteration. And it's my pleasure to be here again. Um, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so um, it's a piece of applied category theory. It's category theory applied to logic in computer science. So uh, yes, there will be diagrams, but there won't be any strings attached. Uh, yes, there will be toposes, but they won't be institutional. Um, um, we're not trying to save the planet, but at least we're trying to be constructive. <laughs> um, the category theory, fortunately, is something really simple, which I expect you all know. Um, I'm going to assume that you know what an initial algebra for a functor is. So if I have a category and I have a, a functor on it, uh, an endofunctor, uh, as I'm sure you know, an F algebra, uh, if the functor is called F, is an object together with a morphism from F of A back to A. And uh, there's obvious notion of morphism of, of F algebra. So we get a category and the initial object in that category, if it exists, is the initial F algebra uh, for that functor. And as a piece of notation, I'll use mu F for the underlying object of that initial algebra and I'll use iota sub f for the uh, algebra structure morphism. So, um, as I expect you know, initial algebras of endofunctors uh, are known, as it were, to computer scientists who use some kind of category theory because they crop up all over the place when you have various kinds of inductive structure and um, or duly co-inductive structure. And when you have uh, you know, recursion schemes and co-recursion schemes for those kinds of structures, giving us semantics for those kind of things using category theory almost always involves somewhere choosing a suitable category C and a suitable endofunctor F and um, uh, constructing an initial algebra for that endofunctor to give a meaning to, to the particular uh, inductive structure that you're interested in. So it's, it's a, a thing that crops up uh, a lot. Uh, more specifically, and it's the thing that motivates the work I'll be telling you about, um, people have been interested in giving categorical semantics of various kinds of dependent type theory. So Martin Lerf type theory on various kinds of steroids. Um, and um, in particular, uh, dependent type theory, where you have various kinds of inductive types. There are, there's a whole menagerie of different sorts of inductive types that you might uh, consider. But again, giving a, a, a categorical semantics of that kind of dependent type theory recently has involved people looking in various kinds of toposes, very often just a pre sheaf topos, and um, constructing models of the type theory therein. And for the inductive types, Therefore, you end up looking for conditions on internal functors on universes in those toposes that ensure that you can get initial algebras for those functors, and then using those initial algebras to model the, the various kinds of inductively defined type that you're interested in. I'm just going to breathe for a moment. It's very constraining wearing a mask. So unfortunately, um, those toposes um, don't satisfy uh, the usual principles of classical logic. So it's not that you can take usual classical construction, and there are various classical constructions of initial algebras, and just replay them in those toposes, because the toposes tend not to satisfy the law of excluded middle, and they tend not to satisfy the axiom of choice. So um, Therefore, we're interested in finding, uh, um, proving theorems about the existence of initial algebras for functors in those kind of, uh, of toposes. And it turns out that there's, a, there's a, a weak form of choice called WISC, weakly initial set of covers, uh, which was originally suggested in the context of type theory by Thomas Streicher and in the context of constructive set theory by, by Ike Murdike and uh, the late Eric Palmgren and Benno Vandenberg. 
And um, that's a, a, a choice principle that turns out to be fortunately satisfied by the kind of topologies that one uses in constructing models of type theory. So various uh, realizability topologies, various sheaf and pre-sheaf topologies based say over classical sets, uh, all, all satisfy WISC. And it turns out, and this is the sort of result I want to show you that uh, one can give a constructive version of uh, one of the classical ways of constructing initial algebras due to Julia Adamek, um, which works uh, not in an arbitrary topos, but in a topos satisfying this uh, weak form of choice called WISC. So the aim of the talk is to sketch to you what's involved in, in that result. So let, let's start by recalling Adamek's theorem about initial algebras in, in classical mathematics. Okay. And um, so how, how do you, I mean, obviously not every functor on the category of sets has an initial algebra. I mean, the power set functor doesn't, but if it's gonna have one, one way to get it, okay, since, there's a correlation between initial algebras and inductive constructions is to just iterate the functor as much as you can, which classically will mean transfinitely often, and see whether it becomes stationary at some point. So you start with the initial object in the category. Let's suppose we're in a category with uh, co limits or co limits of ordinal chains, let's say. And uh, start with the initial object and uh, apply F and then apply F to that and so on. And uh, um, at a successor ordinal, you just apply the functor. And at a limit ordinal, you see that you have a diagram of things that you've already constructed. You take its co limit to be uh, the value of, uh, of the thing at stage, the limit ordinal, and then carry on. And Adamek's theorem is that uh, if that process becomes stationary up to isomorphism at some ordinal lambda, some limit ordinal lambda, then that's going to be an initial algebra for the, for the functor. So, um, and the structure morphism will actually be the inverse of the, uh, of the transition iota for, for that limit ordinal. So that's a very old theorem. And it's, it's, it's the categorification of, um, you know, one of the classical ways of constructing a fixed point uh, in, in complete lattices just by, by iterating monotone functions and uh, taking uh, uh, large joins. Okay, so that's a, that's a very old classical theorem. It's a classical theorem for a number of reasons. Principal reason is that um, you use the law of excluded middle all over the place in that. I mean, so the properties of classical ordinals their good properties depend on the fact that uh, you have the law of excluded middle. So, I mean, a, an ordinal is in particular a totally ordered set, the trichotomy uh, for, for the order. And uh, you can see in this construction that we're uh, doing one thing at zero, we're doing another thing at successor, and we're doing a third thing at a limited ordinal and relying on the fact that uh, an ordinal is either zero or successor or a limit. So, so the law of excluded middle comes in and that's not gonna be available to us in the internal logic of, of, uh, of the toposes that, that we're um, looking at. So we, we've got to find some way around that. But the other thing is that um, there may not be very many functors constructively that preserve um, co-limits of shape kappa, some limit ordinal kappa. So classically, you would uh, your your functor is going to be described in some way. It might be some polynomial functor or whatever built using you know various infinite sets, and uh, to show that it preserves co-limits of uh, size kappa for some large uh, ordinal kappa, you'd end up using the axiom of choice to 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 do that. So um, and again, the axiom of choice won't be available to us. Uh, in these toposes, so we have to think of some way around that. Okay, so that's the name of the game. Can we can we constructivize uh, that iterative construction of, of, of initial algebras? Okay, and I'm going to show you how to do that. And I, I'm going to continue to describe what I'm doing in informal 
uh, language of mathematics. But now you should think that everything I'm going to say from now on is formalizable in the internal logic of, of, of a topos. Uh, well, actually, a topos doesn't have a single internal language. The, it depends on, on uh, what you're interested in. Uh, here, it's convenient for the internal language to mean some flavor of Martin Lerf type theory, extensional Martin Lerf type theory. Um, uh, with, with, I'm only going to look at toposes with natural number objects, so with infinity and with internal universes. Um, and so the internal language will have a, a collection of, of uh, universe types in it, um, each belonging to the next one. With, with a sub-object classifier universe of propositions sitting inside all of them, closed under sigma types and pi types. So that, that's a little bit more elaborate than, uh, you know, uh, if you take a man on the street and say, what's the internal language of a topos? Um, you know, I'll probably ignore you, but, but, uh, but around here they'd say, oh, it's intuitionistic higher order logic. Uh, uh, so this is going a little bit more than that by throwing independent types as well. But, uh, and um, how do you know that I'm, my informal description is going to be formalizable in that way? Well, in the end, I think, you know, you can say, well, I'm an experienced uh, mathematician or whatever, and uh, what I do is always right, um, which is, of course, true. But, um, but we do make mistakes. And, uh, and actually, some of the things that we're formalizing are, are pretty complicated. Certainly not of the nature that you would want to formalize directly in the language of categories. So you would definitely not want to do these constructions directly in terms of objects and morphisms. You've got to use some kind of internal logic uh, to describe the constructions. And, and what we do is, is check that we're honest, as it were, by um, formalizing them within a theorem prover. Uh, we use Agda, which is a version of Martin Lerf type theory. And the system checks that the proofs that you've constructed are, are um, correct proofs of the, uh, of the propositions that you, you've constructed. It's actually a little bit harder work in Agda because uh, it's not extensional type theory, it's, a, it's an intentional type theory. It's not in predicative, it's predicative. So, so there's a little bit more work to do uh, in, in the uh, formalization. But that's available to look at if you're if you're that way inclined. Okay, so but I'm, I'm not going to to burden you with uh, any more details of what that formalization looks like. And so I'll continue to refer to functors on, for example, set. Um, and I don't mean the category of sets. I mean the category of sets and functions of some universe in the topos described using this internal language. So everything will sort of be, be phrased in that way. And we'll make sure that we, we, uh, we only use constructive principles. Okay, so the first step is to get rid of that uh, trichotomy is the ordinal zero successor or, 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 or a limit. And one way of doing that, uh, I, I learned from, uh, actually from, from Agda's use of something called size type, but goes to, to a paper of Arbel and, and Pienke, and they quote Springer and, and Dam. Uh, and that's just a, um, something which I think probably has a, a longer history of which I'm not entirely aware. So if, if you know better references to this particular way of, of doing the iteration, which they call an inflationary iteration, then uh, please do tell me. So instead of doing three different things according to whether you're zero successor or limit, you do the same thing at each ordinal stage, which is that uh, uh, recursively you already constructed things. So we're, we're going to do something at stage alpha. So already we've got the construction for all stages beta strictly less than alpha. So we take the functor on the thing we've constructed mu beta of f, and we note that that's a, a diagram and it, we take its co-limit. And that will be what, uh, what we take as mu, the, the thing at stage alpha, mu alpha f. So it's uniformly, no matter what ordinal you're at, you do the same thing. And that will give you in, in the long run, transfinitely, the same effect as, as, as the original uh, construction. 
But the cool thing about that is that actually that iterative iteration, inflationary iteration, doesn't actually really use very many properties of being an ordinal. So we can abstract away from ordinals and replace them by some thing that I'll just call size. So a, a size is just going to be a set in, in our type theory, equipped with a, a relation of less than. We need that relation to be transitive. We need it to be directed, by which I mean that any finite set of things, any finite set of sizes, you can find an upper bound with respect to, to less than. And, and crucially, we need it to be well-founded. And again, you can't state well-foundedness you know, the common way of doing it to say is that there are no infinite descending chains. That's not constructively strong enough. You have to state well-foundedness in a sufficiently uh, positive way. Um, and one way of doing that is, is as an induction principle. So if we have a, to say that our relation is well-founded is to say that if we've got a, a set of sizes S and that set's closed in the sense that, that uh, a size I is in S, if all its predecessors are in S, that then implies that S has to be the set of all possible sizes. So, so that's that's the definition of being well-founded. Uh, and that's a very standard thing in, in constructive uh, uh, mathematics to use, to use that. So size as defined in that uh, green box there, that's gonna play the role of, of, uh, of, of what ordinals did. In fact, more specifically of limit ordinals because um, classically a, a size, an ordinal is a size if it's a limit ordinal. So the directedness property is gonna rule out zero and uh, successor ordinals and just leave us with limit ordinals. Okay, so It's possible if you if you start with a with a uh, a functor. Let's just assume that we're in a category that has all small co-limits. So again, what I mean, you know, in terms of the internal language is that that the, the small means uh, with respect to one of the universes, say the first one, set zero, and uh, we have some some uh, possibly large category living in another universe, but uh, locally small in the sense that its homes are are, are in the uh, at universe and we have co-limits uh, in the usual sense in there. So if we have an endofunctor on that category and we've got a size in the previous slide sense, then you can construct this inflation reiteration and you can do it by well-founded recursion, basically. Um, so the, there is a, a, a sequence of objects indexed by size, mu i f, as i ranges over the sizes satisfying that, that recursion equation. Actually, I, I'm being a little bit loose there because it, it has to satisfy not just that equation at the level of objects, but uh, at the level of uh, morphisms, you'd want the, the transfer from, from uh, mu i to mu j to, to, to be induced by the, uh, 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 the thing between co-limits in the correct way, but I'm just uh, eliding that, that, that detail here. So it's possible to always construct such a, a size index sequence of things. Uh, and in fact, you just use transitivity of, of the less than relation and the well-foundedness crucially of, of the relation, but not the directedness property at this stage to get that uh, sequence of, of, of objects in C. And then um, one can show that, that uh, uh, Adamic's theorem goes through in the sense that, that if you have a functor that preserves co-limits of size kappa for this notion of size. And if you take the sequence, size index sequence of, of objects that the lemma says that you can construct, you can show it's a diagram. Um, but here we're talking about diagrams indexed by sizes. Sizes are strictly speaking are semi-categories, right? Because uh, the morphisms are instances of the less than relation. That's an irreflexive relation because we're well founded. Um, so we don't have identity morphisms, but we have a uh, composition of, of morphisms. So it's a, it's a, a semi functor. A diagram means a semi functor on a semi category. But we can still have a theory of co, -limit, co limits for such things. And if you take the co limit of, of that inflation reiteration, that is indeed an initial algebra for F. So that's quite a, a satisfactory 
constructivization of, of, of Adamek's um, uh, theorem by replacing the original form of iteration by inflationary iteration and replacing the role of ordinals by, by this notion of, of size. That's not the end of the talk. Because <laughs> um, there's a problem. Uh, nice though that theorem might be, it might not be of much use, right? Because um, we actually want to have initial algebras for various functors that we're interested in. So how do we know that there are any functors that preserve co-limits of some size? Okay. And that's so classically that's where you know, if you if you gave me a functor constructed in some way, I'd find a big enough ordinal um, and prove co-continuity for, for, for with respect to that, or co-limits indexed by, by that ordinal. And I'd use the axiom of choice probably uh, to do that. Okay, so so here we have to to think about constructivizing that. But the general idea of big enough, meaning somehow, so big enough classically means that you have an ordinal there you've got enough uh, upper bounds of, of uh, index families of, of, of elements of the ordinal indexed by, by some infinite set that you're interested in. And that's perfectly fine in a constructive setting. So, so um, uh, it's just that um, you have to be a little bit careful. You want to do it not for one set, but for families of sets. So if, if we've got a, a signature, some set A and a family of sets indexed by that set A, so that's just like uh, uh, um, saying that we've got some operation symbols and each operation symbol, its arity is, is given by the, the, by the function B. Okay, I'll say that a size is sigma filtered for that signature sigma, just in case that you have upper bounds for, for indexed families indexed by the arities in, in, in the signature. And the, the cool thing is that, that if you give me a, a signature, um, then uh, what we do know constructively is that you can look at the polynomial functor given by that, that, that uh, signature and constructively that does have an initial algebra. Um, so that, that uh, can be constructed without using uh, law of excluded middle or, or the axiom of choice. Um, so we have models of, of so-called W types, well-founded trees. And um, if you just enrich the signature slightly to put a binary and a unary operation in so that uh, that will give you directness, you can, you can make a size for each signature uh, sigma in a, in a very uh, straightforward way. So, that, so the, there are a, a lot of, of sets of sizes around uh, and, and we can find sets of sizes that are big enough in, in this sense of having enough upper bounds. There's one subtlety is, is what, what is the, uh, the order that you put between the, the well-founded trees. And we, we use, uh, Paul Taylor developed a sort of constructive theory of ordinals called plump ordinals. And we use the plump ordering between uh, well-founded trees. But I'm, if you're interested, you can see the details in the paper, but I, I'm not going to, to uh, go into them in, in this talk. But, but there is a a well-founded ordering on, on the trees, which is may, maybe not the first thing that you think of, but uh, which works very nicely in this setting to give us enough upper bounds. So let's say that a functor between two co-complete categories inside our internal language in our topos with, with uh, natural numbers and universes, let's say it's sized if it preserves co-limits of um, sigma filtered sizes and a, and a size is sigma filtered uh, when you've got upper bounds of, of, um, of arities coming coming from sigma okay so the object of interest then is is um are there very many constructively are there very many sized functors because what we've got so far tells us that every sized functor has an initial algebra right because the theorem says that we can form an initial algebra if we can find some size uh, so that the, the functor preserves the limits of co-limits of, of that size. Uh, and um, so sized functors will, will have initial algebras. So are, are there very many sized functors? Well, I mean, some things are easy. So the identity functor is sized. 
you can compose sized functors and they will again be sized and the constant functor is sized because we, we made sizes be directed. What's not so easy is to see if you say had a small diagram of sized functors and took its co-limit or its limit, or if you um, took initial algebras uh, with respect to one variable whilst leaving the others fixed to get a sort of parameterized initial algebra, would the resulting functors again be sized? And uh, um, the answer that we have is yes, as long as you allow us to assume this weak form of the axiom of choice. So I'll spend the, 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 a little bit of time telling you what, what WISC is um, next. Well, you remember the axiom of choice. Uh, one way of saying it is that if you've got a, a subjective function from B to A, you can find a section for it. Um, okay. And, and that would be true even if B is a very large set. I mean, suppose A lives in, in say, the universe set zero, and B is in some bigger universe, say, set one, and you have a subjection from B to A. The axiom of choice is still going to give you a way of splitting that, that subjection. Um, using, I suppose, collection in, in set theory to, to uh, form a small set of non-empty sets from which you then pick things. So that, that's, that's a C, right? So WISC is a, a pretty simple um, variation on that where you just replace the role that the identity function on, on A is playing by just a, some small family of things. Okay, so... so um, the WISC axiom says that every set in some universe, let's say set N, you can find a, 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 in the same universe a, a, a set of, of subjections which are weakly initial amongst all the subjections from any universe it, uh, it, into A. So if I, if I have a B to A where B might lie in a larger universe, there's some, uh, there's some element of the, of the weakly initial family, CI, uh, which um, factors in the way shown on, on, on the slide. Okay. So I think if you, when you first see that, it, it's um, not immediately apparent why that's any much less of an ask than the axiom of choice, really. I mean, clearly it's some sort of choice principle because you're, you're saying somehow magically you've got this this, this collection of things for, for A. And if you give me some arbitrary uh, uh, subjection E, I can, I can split through one of the, the things in the collection, but, uh, but not in any canonical way, just that there exists some, um, some splitting. So, so certainly ZFC satisfies WISC, right? Rather trivially, the, the uh, single family with the identity in it will, will be a, a weekly initial set of covers for, for A. But the interesting thing is that, that um, as um, Vandenberg and, and Murdoch show in one of their papers, that if, if you've got a topos that happens to satisfy WISC and you do one of the sort of pretty standard constructions like taking internal pre sheaves to form the pre sheave topos over it, or maybe you have a, 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 a site and you form a, a, a topos of sheaves on, on that topos E. Or maybe you have a, a, a partial obligative algebra and you form a, a realizability topos built out of E. So um, all of those things uh, will still satisfy WISC if the original uh, topos satisfies WISC. So if, if, we, if we assume in the real world that the axiom of choice is true of the category of sets and we start building sheaf toposes and realizability toposes and iterating that in order to find interesting places in which to model, in this case, various kinds of dependent type theory, all of those toposes will, will satisfy this WISC axiom. So, so, um, so it's actually uh, not much of a constraint. I mean, some people would call it a, a constructively acceptable form of choice. I don't know whether that's really uh, uh, the right way of putting it because it, it's, um, I think for many constructivists wouldn't find it very acceptable, but, but if you're in the business of, of building models in toposes, then uh, it's an axiom that you are going to have satisfied more often than not. Not always. I mean, so, so there's a paper that shows that the, there are indeed toposes that don't satisfy WISC. 
So, um, but if we assume that we've got it, then actually we can get a long way to, to recover the kind of thing that was happening classically. So if you, for example, if you, if you have a family, a diagram of, of, of endofunctors on some universe um, that are all sized, okay, in the sense that I've been talking about, and you take its limit or its co-limit, then that's again a sized functor. So that, that's, um, I'm not gonna give you the proof of, of that uh, because it's, uh, um, I don't have enough time basically, and it, it's somewhat intricate, but you, you use WISC maybe in a slightly non-obvious way. I mean, that, that um, it's not just as it were that you have to, to find a size where you've got uh, upper bounds for the, um, um, you know, for, 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 for the, um, uh, the signatures that, that are coming from, from FD being sized for some size, but you then also have to, to um, um, sort of do covers of covers in order. There are two things that you need to, uh, to prove um, when you're proving that something preserves a, a co-limit uh, in, in sets. You, you need something to be an isomorphism that's going to be a, both an injection and a surjection, proving that the, the, the canonical uh, morphism uh, from, as it were, the co-limit into F of the co-limit is an injection uses one lot of, 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 of whiskiness and proving it's a subjection sort of uses it uh, twice. Uh, so it, it's a, a somewhat uh, intricate argument, but nevertheless, we know it's true because we've proved it in ACTA. Uh, <laughs> um, so so, um, so what do you get out of that, that result is that, is that sized functors in, in these top offices that satisfy WISP are actually quite a rich collection of, of functors and they all have initial algebras. Okay, so I mean, for example, um, uh, we now know that, that um, if you take uh, Hawke and Gilterud's notion of symmetric container, so that's, you know, a container, um, normally is a set together with a family of sets and the, the polynomial functor associated with it is a sigma of, of exponentials. Um, well, if, if the, 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 the set of operations is not just a set, but it's a groupoid, and if the arity function is, is a functor in, into sets, that's sort of like saying that each arity comes with some notion of symmetry and informing the, the, the um, well-founded trees of, of algebraic terms, you're going to quotient by at each um, for each operator, you're quotient by, by the symmetries on, on the arguments that, that the group or it gives you. So it's just instead of doing a sigma, you do a co-limit over the over the groupoid of, of the exponential x to the uh, set bg. So that's exactly something that we can deal with uh, in this setting, right? Because it's a it's a co-limit of things that are built up which are themselves limits of things that come from uh, 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 identity functions, as it were. So, so as a corollary of the theorem that, that we have that in any topos with natural number object, if you've got uh, uh, a symmetric container on one of the universes, then, then it does have an initial algebra. Actually, we, we have a um, quite a, a, a big generalization of that in the sense that we can cope with pretty much any, any, well, any infinite tree equational theory in, inside this setting. So where you've got some, some signature, but you've also got a set of equations that you'd like to quotient by. So in a, in a, in a different paper, we, we show how the same techniques, unfortunately not, not corollaries of the theorems I'm showing you, but, but corollaries of, of the technique of, of uh, of um, using sizes and, and, and um, using WISC allow you to construct free algebras for, for infinite tree equational theories in, inside one of these top offices satisfying WISC. Uh, so we, we get uh, quite, quite a, a large number of so, so called quotient inductive types being, being modeled there. Okay, so to, to wrap up then. Um, what it seems like is, is that um, in this constructive setting, taking uh, W types, 
So initial algebras for, for polynomial endoclumpers equipped with the so-called plump well-founded ordering. As long as you're, you're in a setting where you've got this weekly initial set of covers axiom, that's a pretty good uh, place in which to do a lot of things that, that um, uh, classically you'd do with, with uh, transfinite uh, techniques and with ordinals. We haven't looked at um, yet, but I mean, it would be interesting to know how much of the classical theory of accessible categories would, would, could be constructivized in, in this way. This isn't, I should say, it's not the only way of going about things. So there's a recent paper by, by Jerry uh, and Stefan Milius and, and uh, Larry Moss. Um, so they're, they're constructing initial algebras constructively in a quite different way. So as it says, without iteration. So they rely on, on um, Pateraya's impredicative, um, but nevertheless uh, constructive fixed point theorem. Uh, in order to, to show how to construct initial algebras for certain kinds of, of functors. So that's a, a somewhat different and I think somewhat orthogonal uh, constructivization of, of uh, but, but motivated in the, by the similar sort of thing. The other thing to say is that, um, uh, so th this inflation reiteration idea that we use to get around um, the uh, trichotomy of, uh, in, in, in ordinals, um, that's just commonly used in, in Agda when people um, use the, 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 the so-called size types that Agda uh, provides, that something that Andreas Arbel built, built into Agda. Uh, actually, they're most commonly used not, not for initial algebras, but for final co-algebras. And um, we certainly do here have a dual theorem, right? I mean, so the, the first theorem I showed you it can be dualized, right? So, so if you have a, uh, a functor that preserves limits of some size and you do the deflationary iteration and take the limit, that will be a final co-algebra for the functor. Well, what I don't know so much at the moment is, is um, what are the, the, the properties of um, limit preservation um, you know, uh, for, for, for um, uh, you know, so the dual notion of sized functor, I don't know how many of those things there are around or so whether that theorem is, is going to give you interesting constructive uh, um, uh, results about final algebras. That would be, I think, interesting to, to, to look at. And I think that the final thing to say is that, that whilst WISC is, is uh, proved very useful to us, it, it is a rather sort of uh, choice looking thing. And um, we're not saying, unfortunately, that it's necessary that, to have it. I mean, so I, I don't personally believe that um, if you, you know, had initial algebras of, of these kind of functors that you could use that fact to prove that WISC had to hold. Um, so I think it's sufficient, but not really necessary. And uh, uh, in, there may be that there are other more clever ways of, of going about things that, that um, uh, avoid it. Who knows? But that's the end of the talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thanks. Uh, we don't have a lot of time for questions, but we can take a couple, I think. Uh, there's a question uh, from Thomas in the uh, on Zoom. Oh, you are muted. Okay. Ah. I can unmute. Thank you. Yeah, I couldn't. Uh, okay, so um, this risk, uh, two questions about it. Does it help to get a terminal algebra if you want to? Sorry, so I this... didn't say anything. I'm getting noise on, on my side. So you say that again, Thomas. Right, so so uh, you needed WISC to construct uh, initial algebras. What if you try uh, to do... Well, actually, no, that, that's not true. The, the initial algebra got constructed without WISC. What we needed oh. WISC for was to show that there were very many functors that did preserve. Okay. Okay, yeah, so if you decide to construct terminal co-algebras, yeah. would you need WISC as well or something like that? Or you need co-WISC? Uh, no, I think you'd, you'd probably need WISC, um, but the straight answer to your question is I don't know because we've not really seriously thought about it. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and can I have another question? Uh, yes. 
as far as I'm concerned, you can, but I'm not chair. Right. <laughs> I'll just go ahead. So is yeah, risk, on. I mean, you, you stated in uh, categorical terms, but there is another, um, th this univalent type theory people also look at constructivity from a different angle. So is risk compatible with univalent principles? Oh, well, that, that's, a, that's an excellent and very good question because something that we're very often asked is what, why are you using, uh, you know, the, 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 the sort of uh, agda with the uniqueness of identity proofs, wouldn't it be nicer to, to use univalent foundations? And indeed it would, because at the moment, what we do is we prove that for every size functor there merely exists an initial algebra course, that initial algebra is unique up to isomorphism, but not necessarily unique. If you had univalence around, it would be unique. Um, so there is some point to um, considering uh, whether these things work in the presence of univalence. Again, my quick answer is I, I don't know. I mean, for example, if you took the uh, one of the top offices of, sorry, one of the cubicle sets models of, 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 uh, of hot, you know, based in a top off of, of pre-sheaves of um, cubicle sets with vibrant types, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, the topos itself, the outlying topos satisfies WISC. But a different question is, does, does the model involving vibrant types satisfy WISC? And I, I don't know whether that's true or not. That's something, for, something that should be, should be investigated, I think. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to quickly ask, is this, a, so you've risked up there as having these punky ordered W types, is that another assumption on the topos as well as having? No, no, so, so every topos with natural number object has, has, has enough sizes, has W be. types and you can, the, the plump order is perfectly uh, definable. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we should, we should move on. Sorry, William. Um, so, Thomas, are you ready? So, if you let me share the screen. Not right, yes. We should thank the speaker, maybe. All right. So, can I share it? All right. Okay. So, do you see my slides now? Can you see my slides? Yeah. Okay. okay. Everyone ready? Okay, so next up we have Thomas Jackel, who will talk about Lavash type theorems and game co-monads. Thank you. Thank you for pronouncing my name so well. Um, so this uh, is, a, in some sense, you can think of it as a continuation for where Nihil uh, stopped yesterday. <laughs> Uh, but I will give you a little bit of background or on where this all comes from. Uh, so, so this, this is a theory um, or it's a part of a broader program that uh, we call structure meets power. Um, so this, this name was coined by Samson Abramsky and Anui Davar. And um, the idea is that um, in theoretical computer science, we have those two distinct fields of research, one that is more focused on semantics and the other is more interested in complexity theory or expressibility and stuff like that. And, and in this uh, structure meets power, we're trying to bring the researchers together and foster interaction between the two fields and hopefully progress uh, both sides of, of the theoretical computer science. And we just recently had a, I would say successful workshop where we brought people doing all sorts of um, different kinds of uh, research on structure meets power. Also uh, people who were doing it even before uh, Samson and Anush. So, um, but in this, uh, uh, in this uh, research that uh, uh, this paper is concerned with, uh, this is coming from the theory of game commonance that was started by um, Samson and Anush, uh, maybe three years ago, I think. And um, so it is looking at a particular um, sub part of this structure meets power. So the, the idea is to use tools from category theory, namely uh, commonads in finite model theory and combinatorics. 
So this is the whole uh, background story. And uh, what we are, um, the, well, the, the strategy for uh, some of the, um, let's say, progress in both fields, as far as we see it uh, here is, uh, in this 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 paper is what uh, we look at some of known theorems uh, in combinatorics and we notice that they can be formulated uh, categorically and uh, in, in a more general level and then we use common ads to express the particular uh, to to to, uh, to get to the particular known results so we we the, uh, the theorems we have are parameterized by common ads, and then we swap common ads and we get different known results. So this is the idea that we have a uh, general categorical result. And then just by swapping common ads that express certain properties, we, we are able to recover all the results. So that, that's the strategy. And so we are looking at, in particular, Lovash type results in this research. So what is a Lovash type result? Mm. This goes back to Lavash uh, in, in 1967. So he proved that if you have two finite, finiteness is very important, uh, relational structures A and B, they are isomorphic if and only if. Uh, the number of homomorphisms uh, from any other finite relational structures are the same. So you might be looking at it and thinking, hey, hang on, I, I know this, this is, uh, a corollary of Yone dilemma, right? But this is this is not. This is a different um, spin on it because we don't require this C to be uh, uh, this isomorphism to be natural in C. So we don't have uh, a natural isomorphism of of those uh, representable functors. Instead, we have an unnatural isomorphism. So that's that's the difference. Um, and so that's what uh, Lavas proved in 1967. And it immediately was generalized by Alex Poulter to a categorical setting. So then it really could apply to, I don't know, groups or uh, uh, monoids or whatever uh, you, you want. Could be algebraic structures, mixed algebraic relational. Uh, so this is a general statement about just an arbitrary, finitely well powered category, which is also locally finite and has extreme epi monofactorization system. And then the statement is as in Lovash uh, proof. So it, two structures are isomorphic if their representable functors are unnaturally isomorphic, right? So, so he calls those categories combinatorial where you can look at uh, when, where this, this uh, holds. And, and there were later other categorical formulations. But as far as we know, this is where it stopped from the categorical point of view. And mostly research concentrated uh, around the uh, uh, combinatorial questions. So maybe looking at different conditions, maybe if we know that the structures that we have are graphs and they are maybe planar graphs, then maybe it's not necessary to look at all other finite structures. Maybe we only need to look at um, some, some other, uh, some uh, subclass. But only recently, uh, there was, uh, a different spin put to this Lavash type results. So uh, as, as you might know, the uh, question to decide whether two graphs are isomorphic is uh, conjectured to be an NP complete problem. It's in NP, but uh, it's not known whether it's NP complete. Um, um, but uh, this uh, Dvořák and Groja recently, they proved that we can restrict the notion of isomorphism by, by uh, restricting the class of structures that we, we, uh, look, uh, that, that we use to test the homomorphism counts. So in particular, uh, they, they looked at logical equivalence with respect to this FO uh, hash. So that's an that's extension of first order logic with counting quantifiers. So we, we add quantifiers, there exists at least n x's and uh, for phi x, let's say, and that would be true if there are at least n different x's that satisfy a formula. And so if we have this uh, logic, the uh, counting only the uh, structures which have three width at most k amounts to uh, logical equivalence with respect to a fragment of this logic. And that would be a fragment where we only allow k many variables. 
that was Dvořák's result. Dry's result says if we have, if you look at structures of three depth at most k, that amounts to looking at this fra fragment of this logic where we uh, only allow nesting of quantifiers up to depth k. If you don't know what three width or three depth is, it's there, those are uh, important and well studied combinatorial parameters. But the point is, these uh, these are other um, uh, Lovash type results that uh, actually, when we look at the assumptions of those theorems, they perfectly match what we know about the commonants, uh, game commonants that were studied in the Abramsky uh, and uh, Dawar's um, research program. So, so that got us thinking if, despite these two theorems having completely different proofs, whether we can have a more general category pr pr proof that would be agnostic on the commonant we take, and then we get those results back from just instantiating it with the appropriate commonants. So that was the um, that was the idea and motivation. Now let's look at briefly. Let's look at commonants. I don't think they have been defined in this conference yet. So it's like commonants, but with arrows swapped. So we uh, this is a Kleisleman's definition. You might know other definitions. Uh, they're equivalent. So we have an assignment on objects on a category. We have a coordinate for every for every object in the category, and we have this kind of lifting. So we have a morphism of CA to B. It can lift to CA to CB. And these uh, have to we have to satisfy those laws in order to call this a commonant. And those laws basically say that those morphisms CA to B form a category. Okay. Uh, so this is a uh, well-known definition. What is, I think, less, less known is the, uh, is the simplest example, maybe the second simplest, uh, uh, on the category of sets. And th this one is actually, I'm, uh, I'm showing it because it underlines a lot of the commonant, uh, game commonants that, that we have uh, in the, that I will define next. So I would say this really is the way this commonant behaves on sets is giving us all the properties later on in the commonants that we studied so far. So that's, let's look at it. So it's a, it's a commonant, call it list K, uh, where K is just a number, uh, uh, positive natural number. And uh, list K of set A is just a set of all words over the alphabet A that have length at most K. So that, that, that will be, uh, instruction and the co-unit as you see just uh, picks out the last uh, letter of every word and the lifting if you have a function that goes from list k a to b you have you lift it to list k a to list k b by just sending a word a1 up to a m to a word b1 up to bm so this is these are same lengths and uh, the i'th element here is exactly the same as where f maps the initial segment of that length. So, so this is how the, this common ad is defined. Uh, so this is an important example for us. And another uh, uh, notion from category theory that we need is the notion of uh, co-algebras for common ads. This is a very simple definition. It's stated here in full. So a, a morphism in a category uh, with common C that goes from A to CA is a co-algebra provided that it makes the following two diagrams commute. And, and what does it mean for our example of uh, the co-algebra of lists? Uh, if you fixed a set A, it turns out that the co-algebras for this set A and this common list K correspond precisely to forest orders on set A that have depth at most k. So forest order is any pre-order when, whenever you take a downset of a set, you get a finite chain. Okay, so so that that's all. Uh, and as I will not define all commonants, I don't have time for that. All commonants that we studied so far, but they all uh, are very very much tree-like. So so that's that's why it's very useful for us to know this example. And right. So another thing to say about algebras is that um, they form a category and we have this adjunction. So it's like when you have algebras and monads, but this is swapped. So the forgetful functor is the left adjoint 
and the free call algebra is the right adjoint. And what it does for a, a, an object A, you, you return this delta A. So this, this will be the free call algebra. So this is abstractly uh, basically all category theory that we need for, for uh, our uh, work to go through. And so that's what I like about it is actually it is, I think, very easy to explain to people like that don't even know much category theory. Uh, it's very easy to get started. Um, so, so let's finally get into an example of what we actually study. So as I said, we study relational structures. So let's fix a relational signature. So we will have some uh, relational symbols and RETs. And we have a category R sigma of all the structure of the given signature and their homomorphisms. And we define Aaron Freud Frasse commonad on this category. And so given a sigma structure A, we define EK of A will be on the list KA on the set of all the words of length up to K as before. But it's a relational structure, so we also have to add. Uh, interpretation of the relational uh, symbols. So if we have a relational symbol R, uh, uh, a tuple of words is in the relation if and only if the words are pairwise comparable in the prefix order and their last uh, uh, letters are in the relation in the structure A. So that's all it is. And uh, you might think that this is a weird definition or something, but it comes from this Aaron Freud Frasse games, this model comparison games. So it was really naturally derived from trying to semantically model games. So, so re to represent uh, the place of the games as, as semantic structures or structures in the category of relational structures. So that, that, that's where it comes from. And so, as before, we had this k that can vary. So with bigger k, we get a bigger commonad, but uh, which means that those with smaller k's embed as sub commonads into the bigger ones. So we get this chain, and uh, we can immediately make use of this chain by uh, for expressing uh, this tree depth. So if you have a fixed uh, fixed uh, sigma structure or relational structure A, it has a co-algebra for e k if and only if it has three depth at most k. So that's where this uh, parameter k comes handy. And in fact, those algebras correspond precisely to 3D compositions, as Nihal mentioned yesterday. Uh, so this is, as you, if you remember, 3 depth featured in Groes result. So, and I promise that uh, we will also have a match with logic of, uh, of that result. So this commonad will be able to express a fragment of the logic first order logic with counting quantifiers. Uh, but in order to do that, we, because it's, it's logic which has equality, so we have to be able to talk about equality in our relational signature. And so we, there is just a, I would say a little technical hack that we need to do. So we need to extend the sigma signature, the, uh, the relational signature we have with a fresh binary relation, I, that we will uh, interpret as equality. And, but this EK, the EK that we defined on previous slide does, doesn't care about the signature, like what, what, what is repre uh, representing what. So it will just treat this I as any other relational symbol. So we immediately get a commonad of the category of sigma I relational structures. Uh, and so we will make use, so there will be a functor from sigma structures into sigma I structures where we interpret I as equality we just send the structure A into one where I is equality. And then remember we had this free co-algebra functor. And if we put those things together, we get that um, those two structures A and B are equivalent in this uh, uh, fragment of counting uh, of, of first order logic with counting quantifiers, uh, if and only if the uh, free co-algebras of the structures extended with this I relations are isomorphic. So this is uh, a neat way of capturing logical equivalence purely semantically. Um, uh, we can also express the logic without counting, but that requires spans of open pathwise embeddings. 
I don't want, need to talk about it in detail here because we don't need it for what I want to say. Uh, okay, so this was one of the commonants. There, uh, Nihil also mentioned um, the pebbling commonant uh, and pebble regulation commonant, and there are others. Uh, so now on to a general theorem. Let's see if we can. So I'll just state it immediately uh, that we, we do have a general Lovash type theorem. Uh, that is agnostic on the commona that you give me. This is not stated fully uh, precisely because uh, we always have to have this commona and commona for the uh, sigma i structures. But the, here it's more in intuitive terms, but I think that suffices. So if we have a commona C, which classifies a logic fragment in the sense that uh, we just show, uh, we just uh, saw. And it also classifies a class of finite structures, which by which I mean the co-algebras correspond to uh, structures in here. So a structure has a co-algebra for C if and only if it's here. Uh, and also if this common restricts to finite structures, so if I give you a finite structure, CA of that would be a, a finite structure as well. And there is last, so, so this is something that we already expect, otherwise we wouldn't uh, pick the common to to to, uh, to to use it for the theorem. This is something uh, technical, but it's very easy to understand. And this one is something. So it says that if I have a sigma i structure and it it, it has a common uh, sorry algebra for the common then if I quotient it, it will also have a algebra for the common So if let's say this delta is the class of structures of three depth at most k, and I'm saying I have uh, a structure A with this extra relation that has three depth at most k, and I quotient it by uh, by this I relation, it will still have three depth at most k. So this is uh, this is third technical condition. And once we have that, we have this theorem for free. Really, the logical fragment is captured by counting uh, homomorphisms from the structures in this class delta. So this is this is the general theorem, and uh, we, it applies to this Aaron Freud Frasse commona that I just mentioned for the pebbling one that uh, Nihil mentioned that expresses three depth. We have to do a little bit of work. Uh, we have to actually, this violates the second condition. So we have to chop it into, uh, into finitely many pieces and apply this theorem countably many times, but we do get this theorem uh, we, uh, corresponding uh, combinatorial theorem back by using this theorem. There's also modal commonat. And uh, well, outlook is to also test the other commonats that appeared so far in the, in the research. I think I'm missing some. Uh, and there are a lot of commonats that we don't have time to write papers for. So there, every day, I think there comes a new commonat. So that is a potential new Lovas type theorem as well. Um, but what I want to say is that immediately just by having this in this generality, we got this, this uh, modal commonad is a new result. It actually doesn't need, we don't need to check this uh, third uh, assumption, uh, assumption because there is no equality in modal logic. So this is a new result that uh, we got for free. And this pebble relation by talking to Nihil, I believe um, we can easily also get, uh, it's just a matter of sitting down and, and checking the uh, conditions and it should be easier than PK. So this is, uh, yeah, so uh, this is the, I would say the um, prospect of having this in this generality. The, the future is bright. We, we might get a lot of uh, Lovash type results for free. Uh, and just to say a few words of, how, how much time do I have, by the way? Um, can, you, can you wrap up? You're out of time. I'm out of time. Okay, so I just say, I just say this, uh, in order to prove this theorem, uh, there are two ingredients that we need to uh, uh, use. We needed to prove our own new <laughs> Lovash type uh, theorem for just general categories. So if you have a locally finite category with pushouts and weak factorization system, which is well behaved, um, it is combinatorial. So that was, uh, we, we couldn't use any of the previous categorical theorems, but then just by uh, using the fact that forgetful functors create co-limits and isomorphisms, we have that any commonat on category of relational structures uh, 
for then the category of finite algebras is combinat is combinatorial. So there is no restriction on the common app in order to have this. And then, so th this really is, uh, I would say, the most advanced uh, piece of category theory that we use, and also that uh, co-complete and co-well-powered categories have uh, FP strong monofactorization systems. And that's all. And then we just uh, do diagram chasing, and we get the theorem. This this does, that the arrow is the assumption number three, I think, and that's that's basically all we need to know. Um, just one last word. In order to prove this, we needed to use uh, intuition from the theory of polyadic spaces. Sorry, I'm 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 going to have to stop you. Sorry. I, all right. Yeah. So I, I think that's we're completely that's out of time. All I wanted to say. Okay. Okay. Um, we. Oh, do we have time for one quick question? Maybe. Sorry. Okay, then let's let's thank Thomas. Uh, okay. Uh, Rowan, are you ready to share yep. your slides? I'm good to go. Um, Okay, can you, uh, can you see that? Yes. Okay, so our last speaker in this session is Rowan klefsky kozil who will tell us about Frobenius eilenberg moore objects in Dagger 2 categories. Okay, so I'm just gonna move my screen around. Is that right still? Is it, I hope it's not interfering with anything. <laughs> okay. All right, so um, I'd just like to say a big thanks to the uh, organizers uh, for the invitation to speak. Yeah, it's been a great week so far. Um, there is a talk associated with this paper uh, on the archive, uh, which you can check out for uh, more background and detail. Um, but I guess in a nutshell, um, you could say that this, walk, this work is about the formal theory of uh, Frobenius monads. So some of you may know about uh, Ross Street's uh, two-part work uh, with Steve Lack, the formal theory of monads one and two. And so, yeah, this talk is somewhat in the spirit of those papers. Okay, so um, let's just quickly say what a formal monad is. Uh, a monad uh, in a two category is nothing but a monoid object in one of these uh, HOM categories. Uh, so it consists of this quadruple where A is some object of K, uh, S is the endomorphism part, and mu and eta are the multiplication and unit two cells. Um, alternatively, as observed by Benabo, uh, a formal monad is simply a lax functor from the terminal two category uh, to K. And then a morphism of these formal monads uh, amounts to a lax natural transformation and between monad morphisms, uh, we have monad transformations, which are exactly the modifications of lax natural transformations. So formal monads, their morphisms and the monads uh, transformations constitute this two category called monad of K, which is this two category of, of lax functors. Um, for each monad, one of these formal monads, um, there's a two functor whose object part is given by mapping each object X to this eilenberg moore category for the monad in CAT um, induced by that formal monad AS. Um, we can think of this uh, eilenberg moore category as the category of generalized S algebras having domain X. And so if this two functor is representable, then H to the power of S is called the eilenberg moore object for the monad. Um, and as an example, in, in CAT, in the two category CAT, um, EM objects are just the usual eigenberg more algebras for a monad. Um, there is an equivalent notion. Um, so a two category admits the construction of uh, EM algebras when this inclusion to functor here, which sends uh, objects to the identity monads on them has a right adjoint. Um, in general, there is this two natural isomorphism between the category of monad morphisms uh, from the identity monad on X to A of S and the category of generalized S algebras that we just saw. And so from this, we can actually prove that 
k admits the construction of EM algebras if and only if uh, it has all the EM objects. So this isomorphism here is uh, going to be important to us later when we define our morphisms of dagger for Benius monads. So I'll ask you to just try and uh, keep that in mind uh, just for the moment. Um, it turns out that EM objects are kinds of weighted limits. Um, that means that we can freely complete a two category to a two category having all EM objects. So specifically, there is this two category EM of K having EM objects and an embedding, which is really just the restricted Yoneda embedding, uh, such that each two functor here extends uniquely to a uh, EM object preserving two functor uh, as in this diagram. So Rossum, Street, uh, and Steve actually showed that um, EM of K, in fact, has a general explicit description. So in the EM of K, it's this two category, which its objects are the formal monads in K. It's one cells are morphisms of those monads, and it's two cells are uh, these two cells, which commute with a suitable Kleisley composition. And so actually what that means is that EM of K is not the same as monad of K that we just saw, but there is this, um, uh, two functor, which is the identity on, on zero cells and one cells. So uh, we now come to uh, our main definition, or one of our main definitions, and that is that a monad is, in a, you know, a formal monad in a two category is a Frobenius monad. If it comes equipped with this co-monad structure, which has the same object and endomorphism part, such that the Frobenius law is satisfied. Uh, this Identity is just involving the multiplication and co-multiplication of, uh, of those structures. And as an example, we can take um, the strictification of a monoidal category, and this produces a one object, two category, whose uh, one cells are the uh, um, objects of that underlying monoidal category. And uh, so if we look at, do this for vects, then it's for me, a Frobenius monad in sigma of vect it's just the usual motion of a Frobenius algebra that uh, some of you may be familiar with. Okay, what makes uh, Frobenius algebra uh, monads quite interesting is the following result. So if we have uh, an ambidextrous adjunction, which just means that F is both left and right adjoined to you, then the monad generated by that adjunction is a Frobenius monad. And um, well, it may be that uh, our two category in general does not have an EM object for a monad, but EM of K is of course guaranteed to have them. And so if we start with a Frobenius monad, uh, then it turns out that this free, this canonical free one cell is of course left adjoined to the forgetful, but it's also right adjoined to it. This is because we have this Frobenius monad. And so that Frobenius monad is generated by that ambidextrous adjunction in EM of K. So in particular, every Frobenius algebra uh, and these uh, two-dimensional topological quantum field theories uh, are in fact generated by such an ambidextrous junction in EM of sigma of vect. So the main kind of line of inquiry for our work was actually the following question. Um, can we more directly characterize these Frobenius objects in a monoidal category so that is not via these uh, ambidextrous junctions, but rather like directly by construction. So the idea that we have is, can we come up with a notion of a Frobenius Einberg-Mohr object? Uh, is it some kind of limit? And can we co construct a, a completion under such limits? And uh, so the hope is that we can give an explicit description for such a FEM uh, completion whose one cell, whose zero cells are now not just formal monads in the base two category, like it was for the EM construction, but rather formal Frobenius monads, and whose one cells are now not just morphisms of those monads, but rather morphisms of Frobenius monads. And uh, it turns out the answer to this question, all these questions is gonna be yes, but provided we work rather in dagger two categories instead of just general, general two categories. Um, there is, there are at least two reasons why we'd like to do this. So first, we have several other constructions in category theory, which allows to axiomatize certain theories. So for example, this is the case with um, uh, accessible and locally connected categories. 
So likewise, we might think that there's a theory of Frobenius categories, which would be those equ categories equivalent to the FEM completion of some category S. The other direction is coming from things called reads, which are essentially generalized distributive laws. Uh, they are objects of EM of EM of K, so they contain a monad structure, and their object part is a monad. Um, and they include things such as cross products of Hopfer algebras and factorization systems. And so we'd like to consider dagger Frobenius reads, so objects of FEM of, FEM of K, and what those look like in, in, in familiar uh, dagger categories. Okay. Um, so for anyone, I, it hasn't really been spoken about dagger category theory. So for anyone not familiar, we'll just quickly go over the basics. So a, a dagger category is uh, a category with this uh, involutive uh, uh, functor, which is the identity on objects, uh, which is called the dagger of that category. A dagger functor is a, a functor which preserves those daggers. And a monoidal dagger category is one which is both monoidal and a dagger category. And it's uh, the dagger is, uh, um, commutes with respect to the tensor product. So um, good examples, or a very important example is the category of, of uh, complex uh, Hilbert spaces and its bounded linear maps, where we take the dagger of one of those morphisms simply to be uh, its adjoint. Um, okay, so a two category is said to be a dagger two category when those Holm categories are uh, themselves dagger categories. A and the vertical and horizontal composition commute with that dagger. The best kind of example, canonical example is dag cat, the dagger two category of dagger categories, dagger functors and natural transformations. And then a two functor is a dagger two functor when each of those, its component functors are themselves dagger functors. Okay, so, um, a formal monad in a dagger two category is a dagger Frobenius monad if the Frobenius law is satisfied. So now these dagger Frobenius monads are Frobenius monads in the sense we previously saw, since uh, the dagger uniquely determines a co-monad uh, structure uh, with mu dagger being the co-multiplication for that structure. And as an example, uh, we can take things called dagger Frobenius monoids, which are just monoids which satisfy a equivalent uh, Frobenius identity. And in fact, when B is a dagger Frobenius monoid, then tensoring with it um, produces a dagger Frobenius monad. So it turns out that the appropriate notion of algebra for a dagger Frobenius monad is what's called a Frobenius eilenberg moore algebra. Uh, these are eilenberg moore algebras, which satisfy an additional uh, Frobenius identity. And as an example, we have that all three algebras for a dagger Frobenius monad um, are all FEM algebras. And furthermore, the full subcategory of the Eilenberg Moore category of these FEM algebras uh, is itself a dagger category, which we denote by FEM of DT. And it is, in fact, the largest subcategory of DT having such a dagger. So, what we mean by largest here, uh, we're going to explain with a pretty familiar universal property in just a moment. Um, but arguably the most kind of important example of them is the following. So if B is a dagger Frobenius monoid in the category of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, then a FEM algebra for uh, this dagger Frobenius monad of tensoring with B corresponds precisely to these quantum measurements and on, on the object part. So these are these orthogonal projections that sum to the identity. Um, these are the same thing as uh, what are sometimes called the B self adjoint uh, co-algebras for the co-monad. Uh, we now sort of know what a, a formal dagger Frobenius monad is in a, in a dagger two category, but we want to now motivate what a morphism of a dagger Frobenius monad should be. So a simple but important result is the following, that an EM algebra is gonna be FEM, or FEM algebra, if and only if the structure map, the dagger of that structure map, is a homomorphism of EM algebras 
uh, to the free algebra on, on that object, on D. And the proof in one direction is pretty straightforward. So um, F is said to be uh, self-joint if it's equal to its dagger. And to say that uh, dagger, uh, delta dagger is uh, such a homomorphism is precisely the commutativity of this uh, diagram. But that's just the sort of left-hand side of this identity here, uh, this equality. But delta dagger composed with delta is self-adjoint. And so that gives us the right identity on the right-hand part of this equality. And the far left and the far right are exactly um, the FEM uh, condition that we had previously. So um, now we want this dagger two category called DF monad of D, uh, which should be this two staggered two category of dagger for Venus monads, morphisms and transformations between them. And it should obey a daggerified version of that universal property that I asked you to just keep in mind uh, earlier. So that is uh, for a dagger for Venus monad DT in D, um, there should be an isomorphism of these dagger categories, where we think of this right-hand side as generalized FEM algebras for the monad T having domain X, and the left-hand side is the dagger category of uh, morphisms of dagger Frobenius monads from the identity monad on X to DT. And so now an object of the right-hand side is a FEM algebra, so it's this F sigma, and so that means it satisfies the usual uh, associativity and unit condition for an EM algebra. And uh, the commutativity of these two diagrams is exactly those two conditions. But by our previous lemma, since F sigma is a FEM algebra, uh, sigma dagger is a homomorphism of EM algebras for this monad. And there's our free, the free monad, the free algebra on F. But this is uh, exactly this equality on the left, which is the commutativity of this diagram on the right. So from these three diagrams, this one and these two, we can uh, deduce exactly what a morphism of a dagger for Venus monad should be, and it's going to satisfy our universal property. Uh, in our paper, we define the notion of dagger lax functors, which is a lax functor satisfying an additional for Venus axiom. And so what happens is that DF monad of D is this dagger two category of dagger lax functors. And we also have to find things, dagger lax natural transformations and lax modifications and lax limits. And it turns out these things capture the notion of a FEM for Venus Allenberg Moore object, which we're going to get to right now. So similar to EM objects, uh, for each dagger for Venus monad, there is this dagger two functor whose object part sends X to uh, the dagger, uh, this dagger category of generalized FEM algebras with domain X. And if this is representable, then FEM of DT is called the Frobenius Eilenberg Moore object of that monad. So next we should do some sanity checks to make sure we're on the right path with our, these monads. So importantly, uh, the dagger category of FEM algebras is a FEM object, dag cat, right? So that's similar to the, the cat case. And next, we have a familiar universal property from the one-dimensional theory of, of monads. So whenever the dagger Frobenius monad generated by an adjunction has a FEM object in some dagger two category, then there exists this unique right comparison one cell that makes this diagram commute. And it's in this sense that we meant earlier that the dagger category of FEM algebras is the largest subcategory of the Eilenberg moore category having a dagger. So Julie, we have um, Frobenius Kleisley objects. They are denoted by FK of D, T, and they're, they satisfy this dual isomorphism. So importantly for us, it turns out that for a dagger Frobenius monad on a dagger category, its Kleisley category has a canonical dagger structure. And moreover, uh, it is a Frobenius Kleisley object for the monad. Um, this is gonna be important for us because when we're looking at our free completion under FEM objects, um, as is well known, the Kleisley category for any monad has this free forgetful adjunction to the base category. And the left adjoint of this adjunction is bijective on objects. And this is uh, very well known from the Kleisley construction. 
And so this is going to be useful for us. So have, there's a very general theory. Rowan, you have three minutes. Yep. You have three minutes, including questions. Three minutes, including questions. Okay. So I'll just say that uh, when we want to do our uh, co-completions, we're going to be using Frobenius Kleistley objects instead um, and thinking of these things as the co-limits we want because extending uh, this general co-limit theory uh, to the dagger context uh, seems to be uh, too complicated. Marty has already had a look at this. But um, it involves just a single transfinite process of starting with representables and uh, including co-limits of those. And uh, this transfinite process actually ends after one step uh, simply because of this bijectivity of, of uh, the classly construction that we spoke about in a moment uh, just previously. So what turns out is we take um, FEM. It turns out we can construct this FEM of D, and its zero cells will be the Frobenius monads, the Jagger Frobenius monads. Its one cells are the morphisms of these Jagger Frobenius monads, and its two cells are the same as those two cells we saw for the EM construction. Um, as an example, um, we can calculate exactly what FEM of DAG cat looks like using this theorem. And uh, we get a universal property, very similar to the one from the EM construction. And lastly, um, our main sort of goal is to calculate FEM of sigma of F hill. So the strictification, the FEM completion of, of uh, the strictification of the finite uh, dimensional Hilbert spaces. We know what its zero cells look like. These are just Dagger-Frobenius monoids in F hill. It's one cells we haven't yet managed to characterize, um, but we, we have looked into these unitary transformations of fiber functors uh, of Dominic Verdon, and there seems to be quite a strong connection to those. So yeah, at that point I'll end and uh, yeah, here are my references and thank you very much. Okay, thanks. We have a couple of minutes for questions. Question from the live audience. Thanks, okay. uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I just I just have a quick question. So, is the reason that you choose the dagger structure is because you want to control the Komona structure given the monad structure of the Frobenius structure? Okay, sorry, I couldn't entirely hear very clearly, but basically, in a dagger two category. Uh, there's a lot of things that you get for free. So if you have things like ambidextrous adjunctions, those turn out, uh, those, every uh, adjunction is an ambidextrous adjunction. All monads are co-monads. Uh, all monoids are uh, co-monoids. So the dagger structure um, actually allows you to uh, not have to make certain requirements such as having these structures um, and just having that identity, for example, that uh, Frobenius identity. So a lot of the stuff you get for free, I, I'm not sure if that was your question. Uh, yeah, um, well, then my question is, what real difficulties you in face if you drop the condition that you work in a dagger category? Yeah, so, so you have multiple maybe... choice of commona structures given a monad yeah. structure. Yeah. So probably the biggest challenge would be to what, uh, how you define these morphisms of, of Frobenius uh, monads. Because uh, what we did was we, we uh, our idea was to come from, let me just see if I can find it, I'm getting a bit lost. Um, our starting point was really this isomorphism here. So we knew what FEM uh, algebras look like and this is this category of generalized FEM algorithm. We want this universal property. So from this, you can actually quite easily determine what a morphism of uh, Frobenius monad should, dagger Frobenius monad should be, but it's not at all obvious what that should be for, uh, for just standard Frobenius mon monads. There's a lot of theory on this. Um, yeah, a lot of those things like uh, Street and McCurdy have done some good work as well as, um, uh, Brian Day has also done some stuff, but it's those are usually just they amount to what are called just lax uh, uh, monoidal or co-monoidal structures. Um, they don't actually include this 
this final condition, um, which gives us extra power. And here you can see is when the dagger is actually coming in. Yeah, I'm thinking of if you replace the left hand side by some Morita theory, uh, yeah. theoretical two category rather than the two categories you are defining here, would that also work in some way? This is something that we're actually looking into. Uh, it's it's something, uh, as I said, it's not, it's quite closely related to what um, uh, these unitary transformations that um, Dominic has been working with. Um, and there is a, a connection there with that Morita theory that I think you're talking about, but um, yeah, that's still something that we're, we're gonna be exploring, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Sorry, Bryce, we need to stop. Let's, uh, let's all thank Rowan. And that's the end of the session and it's lunchtime in Cambridge.